So, yeah, so, so just to give you a little bit of context on, on the Song of Solomon. Um, the Song of Solomon is really unlike any other book in the Bible. There's, you cannot, there's no other book that's really like it. Uh, it's considered both poetry and wisdom literature, but it's also described as a collection of love poems. And, you know, the literal meaning of the Song of Solomon focuses on a king, which is Solomon, and his bride or his wife. Uh, but to be honest with you, as I was doing research, you know, I kind of felt it already in my spirit. I've kind of researched it a little bit in the past, but I verified it through some through some Hebrew writings that really until about the Middle Ages, the literal aspect of a love between a husband and a wife was never read by the rabbis that way. It was always read by an allegory as a type or a shadow of the love that God had for his bride Israel, that that, that it, it, it was uh, uh, showing that God's love towards his people Israel, because, and you know, that makes better sense because we know that the word of God is really the truth about God's love for a lost and a dying world, and that Israel was a very large step in, in that direction, right? And as New Covenant believers, we would even take it a step further and say that the purpose of the scriptures in the last day fulfillment it's all about a marriage between the king, which is Jesus, and his bride, which is his church. And, and the scripture shows us that. So that is how we're going to approach these selected passages that I chose out today. And um, so one of the main reasons that it was always interpreted by the rabbis as an intimate love story between God and his people Israel is because there's multiple prophetic references throughout the Bible that talks about God as a husband to his people Israel. Amen. And we're gonna I chose a couple of different passages, but already because of time, I'm gonna kind of shorten it up a little bit. But there's one passage that I I went I, I need to preach this passage one day because the Lord put it on my heart about seven months ago, but I really haven't really known exactly what to do with it. But I'm pretty sure one day I'm supposed to preach it out of Ezekiel 16. And it's just I'm just like really intrigued by this passage of scripture. And that's the one that I'm gonna pretty much read to you, but I want you to know that as we read some of these verses, that, that the language is very graphic. You, you begin to see that God is a God that's full of emotion. You, and you begin to see as, as we read these verses that he is jealous over those that belong to him. So, see, some people have a problem with reading Old Testament passages because they talk so much about the New Covenant and that they only view God as a God that just forgets everything. And he does. He forgets. He, throws, he puts our sin as far as the east is from the west when we're truly forgiven. Amen. But, but it's almost like we never understand that the Bible also says that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And that means that if we see some of his character in the Old Testament and the way that he was, that character is still in God. But what we're seeing is his long-suffering nature that he's holding back his wrath until the day that the wrath is going to be poured out. Judgment is going to come upon the earth. And those that are in Christ, that are truly saved, truly converted, truly have the Holy Spirit living on the inside of them, are going to be, are going to be very very thankful and grateful on that day whenever we go to meet him in the air, when we go to be with our king. But I'm here to tell you that there's no scripture tells us that there's a lot of people that were not in the position with the Lord that they assumed that they were in. And that's going to be a very sad day for people. And that's why there's a part to me that can't shrink back from trying to, to try to warn people and to try, try to encourage people and, and to prepare them. Let, let's now, while, while we can, but, you know, the, the Bible says that there's going to be a day when every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. I remember when the war first started getting a hold of me and I read that verse. I'm like, Lord, I'll bow now. I want to bow now. I don't want to have to, to bow later whenever everybody's being forced. I want to bow my heart and my life to the Lord now. I believe that he's real. I've seen what he's done. Amen. So look, he's a God full of emotion. He's jealous over those that belong to him. And look, I'm going to just say it like this. He's angered when he's treated like a secondhand lover. 
I want you to know that God is not pleased with being treated like a secondhand lover. He doesn't like it whenever we put our job or our business before him. He doesn't like it when we put our mama or our daddy before him. Those are the words of Jesus. Any man that loves mother or father more than me is not worthy of me. That's not the words of Pastor Matt. That's Jesus. Okay. And he is not happy when we put our lifestyle and the things that we like before him. I'm not talking about coming to church, folk. I'm talking about Jesus. I'm talking about the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. I'm talking about a personal relationship between you and the Savior of the world that died to set you free. That's what I'm talking about here this morning. He is a jealous God whenever you allow things to come between him and you. Now, a couple weeks ago, I preached on Hosea. You remember that? Because that's one of them. God tells Hosea, what did he tell her? Go marry a woman of whoredoms. Go have a wife of whoredoms and have children of whoredoms because the people have committed whoredom in the land. And he wanted a prophet, right? We talked about that. He wanted a prophet that could feel in his heart and to understand how he was feeling in the midst of all of that. Look at Isaiah chapter 54, verse 4 and 5 out of the ESV version of the translation. We'll be using mostly ESV in a couple of times I'm going to use the Amplified. But look what it says. Fear not, for you will not be ashamed. Be not confounded, for you will not be disgraced. For you will forget the shame of your youth and the reproach of your widowhood. You will remember no more, for your maker is your husband. The Lord of hosts is his name, and the Holy One of Israel is your Redeemer, the God of the whole earth. He is called. Look at Ezekiel chapter 16. This is the one. Boy, this is some heavy duty stuff. I wish we had time to try to break it down, but I'm just going to read it. It's kind of long. Ezekiel 16, and we're going to actually read in the ESV all the way from verses 1 through 17. Look what it says. It says, again, the word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, make known to Jerusalem her abominations and say, thus says the Lord God to Jerusalem. Your origin and your birth are of the land of the Canaanites. Your father was an Amorite, your mother a Hittite. And as for your birth, on the day you were born, your cord was not cut. I can preach that right there. I'm telling you right now. We, some of us still got an umbilical cord connected to the world. And we ain't, letting that, we ain't letting the Holy Spirit cut that umbilical cord. We're still letting ourselves get fed by the things of the world. And it's intruding on our relationship with the Lord. And we don't understand why we never experienced intimacy. But I'm here to tell you right now that the Lord wants to cut the cord. All right? But I'm not preaching this right now. He says it. He says, look at this. He says, he says, your cord wasn't cut. You weren't washed with water to cleanse you, nor rubbed with salt, nor wrapped in swaddling cloths. No, I pitied you to do any of these things to you out of compassion for you, but you were cast out on the open field. You were abhorred on the day that you were born. You know what's sad is, is that back in these days, babies infantis infanticide like abortion was very, very common. But then it was even more gruesome. It was more cruel. If they didn't want a baby, you, know, you hear the story sometimes, they just find a baby in a dumpster somewhere. This stuff happened all the time. They just throw them babies out in, in the middle of a field. And, 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 and that's the this was a common finding if it was a deformed baby or something that, 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 that just breaks my heart to think about that and, and that's what they were doing and the Lord saying that's what you were like Jerusalem that's what you were like my people because you weren't even a people and that's where I found you I found you in your blood in the midst of a field see some of you some of you you ain't like me some of y'all y'all never was bad like me but, but, but people like me, you know how to love on your Jesus but in another kind of way, maybe, because he found you in your blood. Or maybe you hadn't gotten to that spot yet, but, but one day, I, my prayer for your life, my prayer for my life, is that we would get to that spot where we would be reminded, no, he found me in my blood. He found me in my blood when my, cut, my cord wasn't cut, and I was just laying there dying in the middle of a field because nobody really wanted me. Nobody had compassion on me. No, really, nobody really loved me like he loved me but he came and he found me and he picked me up and he washed me amen he washed me and he cleansed me hallelujah and he gave me he gave me hope and he gave he gave me hope thank you lord he says he says in verse six and when i passed by you and saw you wallowing in your blood i said to you in your blood live i said to you in your blood live 
I made you flourish like a plant of the field and you grew up and became tall and arrived at full adornment. Your breasts were formed and your hair had grown, yet you were naked and bare. When I passed by you again and saw you, behold, you were at the age for love and I spread the corner of my garment over you. Anybody that's ever read the book of Ruth? That ought to remind you of chapter three right there. Because Boaz spread his garment over her. It was a sign that he was asking her to be his bride. He was taking her and betrothing her to be his bride. And the Lord saying to Israel right here, to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, when I found you that way, I put my garment over you to betroth myself because you had come of an age. And look what he goes on to say. He said, I bathed you with water, washed off your blood from you, anointed you with oil, I clothed you also with embroidered cloth. He, he didn't just marry her, he blessed her. And he didn't just marry you when, when, he, gave, when he came in a relationship with you. Can anybody here this morning say that the Lord has blessed you? Yes. Yes. Amen. I, I mean, listen, I, I don't know what a blessed definition of a blessing is for you, but to me, it's not just a bank account. I, he's blessed my bank account. I'm going to tell you right now. He has. But, but, I, but I'm going to be honest with you, not just a, it's just not a bank account. It, it's peace of mind. It's, it's hope for tomorrow. It's, it's like, you know, he's given me favor. He's given me favor in, in, in life. He has. And, and I'm telling you right now, he wants to give you favor. He wants to, he wants to uh, move in your life and in your heart. And, and he, wants to, he wants to teach you how to trust in him. And if you'll trust in him, he, he's going to do things for you that you never would have imagined that, that, he, that it could be done. Amen. And, 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 but, but listen, you know what happens too? Because we're going to see the sad, this shift right here in a second. After all that he did for her, it never fails. And, and each one of us in this room have done it in one shape, form, or fashion or another. That even after he pours all his love on us, yes. even after he, he's good to us, what do we do? Mm. We, uh, well, you'll see what they do. He says, he says I, I anointed you with oil. I clothed you also with embroidered cloth and shod you with fine leather. I wrapped you in fine linen. I covered you with silk and I adorned you with ornaments and put bracelets on your wrists and a chain on your neck. And I put a ring on your nose and earrings. You know, that ring in the nose, it actually shows ownership. That's just a thought there. Who, who owned you this morning? And earrings in your ears and a beautiful crown on your head. Thus you were adorned with gold and silver, and your clothing was of fine linen and silk and embroidered cloth. You ate fine flour and honey and oil. You grew exceedingly beautiful and advanced to royalty, and your renown went forth among the nations because of your beauty. For it was perfect through the splendor that I had bestowed on you, declares the Lord. But you trusted in your beauty. See, people start trusting in their, start trusting in their blessings. They start trusting in their riches. They start trusting in the things that God, they take their eyes off of the one that saved them and they put it on the things that the Savior gives them. They start looking at the blessings instead of the blesser. They start looking at, oh, and, and don't tell me it don't happen because it happens to the best of them. Yes. And, and their heart becomes overwhelmed with covetousness. And they start to think that there's something in it of their own self. They start to think more highly of themselves. How do you know so much, preacher? Because it's happened to me. It's happened to me before. And I wouldn't be a good preacher if I didn't admit it to you. And, 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 and we start Start thinking more highly of ourselves and what we are and that spirit and that enemy tries to bring that pride on the inside of us and it starts to bring destruction to our walk with God and he says but you trusted in your beauty you played the whore because you're of your renown and lavished your whorings on any passerby you, you know people will listen I know I'm kind of taking some liberty with the text but whenever people start to get blessed like that by the world they, you know you don't when you hear the word whoring, you start thinking of a prostitute in a brothel, right? I mean, most of the time, that's where you... But what, but what about whenever, what about whenever, like the proverb says, when you sit at the table with a king, consider what kind of man you are if you're given an appetite, man, that you would not eat the king's delicacies. You'd better be better off putting a knife to your throat than to do that. What he's saying is, is that if you're open for a bribe, if you're, if you're so hungry for, for financial gain, if you're so hungry for the blessings of the world that you're willing to partner up with something, see, because you can play the whore or the harlot. I didn't write it. It's written in the word. I know that's a strong word, but it is what it is. It, it said, it, you know, you... You, it's, it's more than just a sexual 
relationship. Whenever we're cheating on the Lord with spirits of covetousness and all this other kind of stuff. And we and again, we, we're so focused on the blessing and the blessings of God that we're not focused on the goodness of God and what he's done for us. Amen. I don't know about you, but we know we need to hear that, especially in America. It, it, I know y'all were quiet because this is already the preacher's already getting off the gate and he's preaching hard. But that's good. That means you're thinking. Praise God. Think. Let us be provoked. Let us be challenged in our thoughts because we've been, been born like that baby thrown in that field. We have been born in this American dream world that we live in. And we have got selfish in our mindsets towards the ways of God. And I'm here to tell you right now that the Lord is not happy whenever our hearts are not fully connected to him. He died for us and he made a way for us to have a relationship. How many times have people done a bad deal because they got greedy for gain and they would have never done that in the first month after they had gotten saved? See, that's what I'm talking about. Any kind of cheating on the Lord is, is like that, right? The Lord help us. Maybe somebody here needed to hear that. I don't know. Maybe somebody here, you're living, you, you got some kind of weird deals going on the backside. You're doing some weird stuff with your taxes. I don't know what's going on, but let me tell you, don't sit here through life. Come on, somebody, help me out, man. You don't sit here through life, fill in the seat in a church week after week, year after year, and thinking that you're punching the God clock and that you're okay. When on the back side, they got dirty deals going on. And no, 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 no. And the preacher's preaching to himself. Let us get, let us be shaken and let us be sober and become sober minded as we see the days growing dark in the land that we're in. It's time for us to get our heart right with the Lord. And he's, I don't know how to get out of the mess. I mean, if you cry out to the Lord, he'll get you out of the mess that you got yourself into. But I'm here to encourage you this morning, child of God, wherever you are, whatever you're dealing with, if you're in a mess, cry out to the Lord and he will get you out of the mess. Amen. I, I implore you, cry out to the Lord and let him get you out of the mess. Amen. And he says, you also took your beautiful jewels of my gold and my silver, which I had given you, and made for yourself images of men, and with them you you played, you played the Lord. He says to Jeremiah, you don't even have to turn there, Jeremiah 2, the word of the Lord came to me saying, go and proclaim in the hearing of Jerusalem, thus said the Lord, I remember the devotion of your youth, your love as a bride. And then he says in Jer a little bit later in Jeremiah 2, he says, Can a virgin or a maid forget her ornaments or a bride her attire? It's almost like, what, what, is it appropriate? And I'm not picking on you if you don't wear your wedding ring, but you, uh, why? Why don't you? And, and it's a good question. Well, I remember when you weren't wearing your wedding ring, Pastor. Yeah, why? Okay, put your, wet, put your wedding ring on if you're married. Come on. Unless you like, well, uh, let me be good. All right, but, but why would you not wear the attire that shows that you're married? And that's what he's asking, right? Who are you married to is what he's asking Israel. Who are you married to? Who has your heart? Okay, all right. So basically I use these scriptures to get us ready. So we can hear from the language of God's emotion and the love that he has for his bride. We can see his long suffering, amen, his patience, his kindness. Yeah, I was thinking this, though. I wonder how many repeated acts of infidelity that the most loving human husband. Have you ever known anybody where you was like, man, that, that guy is a loving husband. Right? Have you ever seen it? Surely in life you've seen somebody. And, you know, as a man, there's been a few men. I'm like, man, you know, I can probably learn something from that guy right there. Right. But I wonder, it's just a thought. The most loving husband that could ever walk the earth. We, we may not know him, but whoever he is. How? How many acts of infidelity, I, I wonder, would he tolerate before finally with a broken heart and tear-filled eyes, he would just walk away? Would it be two, three, four, you know? I, I mean, how many acts of unfaithfulness could a human heart really handle before having to call it quits? Just can't, can't deal with it anymore, right? I mean, that's, that's painful. That, and I know it happens. People, and it's sad that it happens, and, and, and many people in this room probably, it's, it's happened, right? Committed acts of infidelity, and, and it, it breaks, and especially if you love God, it breaks your heart, it breaks other people's hearts, right? And, and, and I get that. And God, but God's a, God's a loving God, and He's a forgiving God, amen? Thank God for that. Thank God that He, that he, that he forgives us. But, but how many of these situations taking place where we've let him down, yet he still loves us. 
He still loves us. He gives us second chances and third chances and fourth chances and fifth chances. And he just never quits on us. And he's long suffering and he's merciful. And so oftentimes we take it for granted. And, and whenever we really do get a revelation, my prayer for all of us this morning and anyone that would watch the video is that the Holy Spirit would give us a revelation of his unwavering love. His unwavering long suffering. He, he, he refuses to quit. And, and he keeps pursuing us and, until, and I'm telling you, it's the most beautiful thing that when you realize I really was that baby thrown off in that field and, I, and my cord wasn't cut, but yet he, he loved me yeah. and he found me. Amen. And he did these things for me. You, you and I need a heart that's thankful for that yeah. this morning. Amen. Yeah. Because he's worthy. Praise God, our King is He's worthy of that. Amen? And look, that's why out of Lamentations, you don't have to turn to Lamentations 3. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faith. So with that context given about God and his, how He sees Himself as a husband with His people being a bride, and how he pursues her with his love. That's kind of the context where we're going to use some of these scriptures out of Psalm of Solomon, okay? And so uh, in Psalm of Solomon chapter 1, uh, starting in verse 2 in the ESV version, and I like the way the ESV kind of puts, at least for this particular kind of literature, you know, I'm not trying to get all fancy and technical on you, but different types of literature in the Bible, it, it's like it requires different kinds of interpretation. You can just sit there and read. You don't read Paul's letters the same way you're going to read the Song of Solomon. Okay, because it's a point. All right, and so we're in Psalm of Solomon chapter 1, and we're going to start at verse 2 in the ESV version of the Bible. It says, let him kiss me. It says, let him kiss me uh, with the kisses of his mouth. Now, if you can see the full picture, the ESV actually puts... Some commentary, I don't say commentary, but it's kind of like leading us. The translators are leading us, and it has the word sheep in there. So it's saying this is her talking, talking about his bride, okay? Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for your love is better than wine. Your anointing oils are fragrant. Your name is oil poured out. Therefore, the virgins love you. Draw me after you. Let us run. The king has brought me into his chambers. And so we see the bride and what she's talking about really right here is intimacy. She's talking about an intimate relationship with her king, right? And and, and that how she feels love for this husband king of hers. And look, the New Testament, she uses the words oil and wine to describe his love for her, her love for him. And look, the New Testament, when it's talking about the covenant of God, it uses the words oil and wine multiple times. The word oil, talking, you know, she said his name is like oil. Amen. Somebody needs to hear this because look, Angie preached a while back on the virgins, right? And the, and the oil is needed in the lamp. Amen. And in the new covenant, you and I need to understand that God has given us the ability to have oil in our lamp. And it's so important for you and I to go to the king, to, to engage in intimate relationship with him and for us to allow him to fill our lamp up with oil. And because listen, there's power in the name of Jesus. Amen. She said, your name is like oil poured out. Amen. Grab a hold of some of that oil. Fill up our lamps, oh Lord, because as the days grow dark, we want our lamps to burn bright. Look, she said, your love is better than wine. Yeah. Jesus referred to the wine in the cup during the Passover as the blood of the new covenant. Amen. And what other love is there like that? Jesus said this, what greater love is there than a man that lays down his life for a friend? I want you to know this morning that Jesus did that for you and he's drawing you and he's calling you and he wants to have intimate relationship with you. And you know, Jesus, I just want you to know this. Jesus is the good Samaritan. Amen. Amen. I, don't, I was gonna. I got the. I got the microphone. I'm just on this new little kick nowadays. I just want people to sing because I can't sing that good. Amen. I don't even know if you know the song. Yeah. <laughs> thanks, <laughs> thanks, man. You're not, you're not gonna stop me from trying. You do good, man. Thank you, sir. 
I appreciate that. It's coming from my heart. Amen. Amen. She may not even know this song. If she don't know it, just throw it to me and I'll give it to God. All right. <laughs> but Jesus is the good Samaritan. And there ain't nobody else helping the beat up and the broken like Jesus is. Amen. And, and Jesus showed up and he found him bleeding and dying on the Jericho yeah. Road. Yeah. And yeah. what he did? He poured in the oil and the wine. Come on, somebody. You got to sing it for the... For the congregation, he poured in the oil and the wine. The kind that restores my soul. He found me bleeding and dying on a Jericho road, and he poured in the oil and the wine. Hallelujah! He poured in the oil. He found me bleeding and dying on the Jericho road, and he poured in the oil and the wine. We ain't done singing this morning. Hallelujah! <laughs> We're going to bring the microphone. Come on, man. This, y'all, if y'all are looking for a professional church, y'all walk into the wrong church. We're here to give glory to Jesus. Amen. Yes, Lord. Praise you, Jesus. Amen. So he poured in oil and wine. Amen. She said, your name is like oil poured out, smoother than butter. Oh, I love to hear your name, Jesus. Yeah, I don't know how you live your life, but I like to say his name in public because I like to watch what it does. Is that wrong? I hope I'm not wrong. Lord, if I'm wrong, please forgive me. I like to say his name in public. It causes people to start squirming. I like to carry Bibles in the restaurant and to start reading. I, oh, I'm Hey, God, the best. Lord, help me. Help me. Because he's worthy. Amen. Yeah. Poured in oil and wine. Yes. Oh, thank you, Jesus. She sings of oil and wine, and Jesus brings the oil and wine. But look at that one verse. Your name is like oil poured out. Amen. Just the mention of his name. That's why I like that song. And I'm like, your name is like honey on my lips. You sing that song right? No? Okay, give it to Nyan. Go ahead, Naya. Your name is like honey. Your name is like honey on my lips. Your spirit is like water to my soul. Your word is a lamp to my feet. Jesus, I love you. She was like, your name is like water poured out. But then the others come in. The ESV tells you the others start talking, right? And, 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 and directs us in this. The ESV shows us that she spoke of the beauty of her groom, the king, and the others agree and they start to join in. And this happens more than once in the Song of Solomon. And it will happen in your life too if you'll let it. Come on. And if you let your heart fall in love with Jesus, you will talk about it in such a way that others will want to know him too. Can you go back to verse 4 right there in Song of Solomon? And, and look, I want you to know that it splits up the verse, uh, I believe. But, it, but see where it says, we will exalt. It's not, not talking about her anymore. It's talking about her friends. It says, we will exalt and rejoice in you. We will extol your love more than wine. Rightly yeah. do they love you. Another spot where this happens is in Song, Song of Songs, uh, same book, chapter 5, verse 8. But let's try the Amplified version right here. And, and she... she uh, She's looking for him. Okay, we're going to get into this a little bit later. But she's looking for him. And she says, I charge you. This is uh, Psalm of Solomon, chapter 5, verse 8. I charge you, O daughters of Jerusalem, if you find my beloved. That's, that's the title of my message, by the way. Jesus, my beloved. Amen. Hallelujah. She says, if you find my beloved, that you tell him that I am sick from love. I'm simply sick to be with him. Now, look, I want you to know something. Whenever we get to the very end of this message, that she's in a dream. And I'm going to give you the context on why she's sick. Okay, and there's good reason for her to be sick in the dream. But she's, she's looking for him. She's desperately seeking him. But she's talking about it. And so then it says in verse 9, if you go to verse 9, and we can see it, the ESV translators put, here come the others. Now they got something to say. She said what she had to say. Now they're saying this. She said, what is your beloved more than any other beloved? Oh, fairest among women, taunted the ladies. This is the a a Amplified, right? Oh, in the Amplified or the ESV? 
taunted the ladies. What is your beloved more than any other beloved that you should give us such a charge? And so she says, have you seen my beloved? I got to find my beloved. If you see him, could you tell him that I'm lovesick? Like I got to be in his presence. I want to be, I want to regain that intimate relationship with him. I miss him. I miss his presence. Hey, amen. And she's like, well, who is this beloved? And then she starts to describe. Him. Now, come on. Y'all ready for this? It might make some of you men feel weird. His head is as precious as the finest gold. His locks are curly and bushy and black as a rake. His eyes are like doves beside the water brooks, bathed in milk and fitly set. Going down to verse 16. His voice and speech are exceedingly sweet. Yes, he is altogether lovely. The whole of him delights in his precious. This is my beloved, and this is my friend, O daughters of Jerusalem. Now I want you to see what happens in chapter 6, verse 1. Because after she starts talking about her Jesus like this, <laughs> now they didn't. They're like, where has your beloved gone? Where has your beloved gone, O most beautiful among women? Where has your beloved turned that we may seek him with you? See, whenever you begin to develop an intimate relationship with Jesus, not your mama's Jesus, not your grandma's yeah, come Jesus, on. come on. But you begin to engage in a true relationship. It starts off with getting saved, my friend. If you've never truly been converted, and let me tell you how you're going to know you're converted. Not, I know I say it a lot, but we got to keep it clear. It's very important. The Lord has instructed me over this last year that I make it very clear what it means to be born again. Okay. It's not just because you raised that hand one time and prayed a prayer. I believe in praying prayers, my friend. I believe in praying prayers. That's not what I'm saying. But you're going to know you got saved when the Holy Spirit moves into your heart. Yes, that's yeah. right. That's Ephesians 1.13 says that when you heard the gospel of truth and you submitted to that gospel of truth, you received the down payment from the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit moves into your heart, you're going to know it because you're not going to be the same. I didn't say you were going to be perfect. I didn't say you're not going to ever have struggles. I didn't say you're never going to face situations. I said you're never going to be the same. Yeah, like, and, uh, and, and listen, the things of God, things are going to start to change. The enemy might try to lie to you and whisper to you and tell you the things of God are lame, but he's a liar and the Father lies and I'm here to tell yes, you the very yes, thing that is. your heart is yearning for is a deeper relationship with Christ yeah, yeah, yeah. Amen. and when the Holy Spirit moves in and he begins to you're going to know it because yes. the things that you used to be able to do you'll be convicted of That's right. and now don't, 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 don't think that you can't steer your conscience now that's not what we're talking about here don't, don't try it it can happen but look, when you truly get converted and you call upon the Lord, amen, and you realize when you heard the, the truth of the gospel that said we were all born sinners in Adam, when that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, and that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have eternal life, and whenever you said, yes, Lord, that's for me, uh, yes, I don't care how old you were. You could have been five years old. You could have been 55 years old. But when you said it and you meant it according to Romans chapter 10 and you believed it in your heart, and you confessed it with your mouth. You said, that's me, Lord. I was that baby laying in that field. I was that baby that was full of blood. I need you, Lord. I need you to come and I need you to, to cleanse me. I need you to cleanse me with your blood, oh Lord. I need you to wash me white as snow. Oh, I'm sorry, Lord. Forgive me for how I lived my life in rebellion against your word. Forgive me, Lord, how I went out and did whatever it was that I wanted to do or still do sometimes. Lord, forgive me, Lord, when I don't treat my brothers and my sisters in, the, in Christ the way that I should, when I don't love others, when I'm selfish in the way. Lord, please forgive me. Because see, the Bible says this. You're not your own, my friend. You were bought with a price. The price of his blood. He laid his life down. So they're like, where is your beloved? Don't be most beautiful. Where is he gone? Where did he go? We want to seek him. Would you? And then I don't know about you, but that's just so intrigued. That's the kind of Christian I'm like. I'm not saying I'm there. I'm just like, Lord. And Paul said, I have not apprehended. You know, he said, I have not yet apprehended, but I'm going to run after yes. that I may apprehend yes. what apprehended me. <laughs> what? I haven't got it yet, but some got me, and now I'm going to try to get it. And I don't know about you, but that's the kind of Christian I want to be. I want to be the kind of Christian that has an intimate relationship with Jesus, that whenever I talk about him, hallelujah, your name is like honey. On my lips, 
<laughs> oh yeah, come on, don't even turn it off. Just go ahead and sing it. Your name is like honey on my lips. Your spirit, your spirit's like water to my soul. Your word is a lamp to my feet. Jesus, I love you. I love you. Oh, thank you, Jesus. I love you. I know these people love you. Help us to love you more. Amen. So her language about him draws others close. He becomes attractive and they, they want to seek him also. See, the Holy Spirit will cause our love for Jesus to grow. He'll anoint our language about the king so that others want to find him too. Amen. They'll start to say there's something different about that old boy. There's something different about that girl over there. See, the anointing of the Lord will start to have its way in your heart and in your life. Your language is going to change, my friend. Come on. Instead of, instead of saying the F-bomb, you'll be talking about a different F-word. It'll That's be right. forgiveness. That's right. right. Faithfulness. That's right. Fortitude. Freedom. Hallelujah. Freedom. Yeah. Come on. Yes. Come on. Yes. Because, see, you ought not be talking like that if you're a child of the Come on. Come on. Yes. As a matter of fact, I'm going to say, if you talk about Jesus one minute, and you're throwing words like that out the next. Do somebody a favor and just leave one of those words yeah. out of your mouth. Yeah, come on. Yeah. Do the king of a favor and leave one of those words out of your mouth. If you can't stop using language like that, quit talking about Jesus. Yeah. Because you're bringing damage to the kingdom of God. But the Lord will set you free if you'll let it. He wants to clean up your mouth. He wants to clean up your heart. Jesus said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So if you're only here running people down, if you're only here talking negative, if you're only here full of malice and slander and gossip, if you're only here full of those kinds of words, guess what? That's what's in your heart, yeah, my friend. Yeah. And the Lord sees it. He's not blind to anything. And But the good news is he wants to set you free. He wants to set me free. He is setting us free. And we're just laughing. Praise God. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Something different about that person over there. They ain't like the rest of us. Right. And I've fallen into the trap. We keep setting the trap for them. Keep trying to bait them. Then you know what? The Lord will give you this Holy Ghost discernment, my friend. Because if you start being a witness in a public place, they're going to start trying to set a trap for yes, you. That's right. yes, they're going to try to bait you to get you into a mess. Right. Right. And you're still walking in the flesh. You're going to blow up them and then, and, make, and then they're over there like, I knew it. I knew it. Yeah, no, no, no. The Lord will give you wisdom, yes. discernment on how to, he'll, he'll navigate you around that little mess. Amen? Amen. And he'll use you in their lives. Praise God. So anyway, look at, look at chapter 7, verse 1. There's something different about that person. <laughs> and, and, and still in the Amplified. It says, her companions began noticing and commenting on the attractiveness of her person. See, how beautiful are your feet and sandals, O queenly maiden. Your rounded limbs are like jewel chains, the work of a master hand. They see the beauty of the king's bride. Her love for the king doesn't only make him attractive to them, but her love for him makes her attractive yes, to them. Yes. Amen? Now, I want to tell you something that I've learned through the years, that there's sometimes I'll be in a relationship or be in a conversation with someone, and the Holy Spirit shows up, Amen. And the anointing is there. And we're just talking about Jesus, right? And we're talking about the kingdom of God. And you can tell the Holy Spirit's ministering to them, right? He's really touching them. But, you know, it doesn't always, the anointing doesn't always, like if they haven't received Christ, sometimes they'll walk away and, you know, maybe the next day they're acting irritated with me. I mean, even if I didn't do anything. I know y'all like, yeah, Pastor Matt, but we know you. But sometimes it's not that. What I'm trying to say is, is that when, when the beauty of the Lord is in the atmosphere, what I'm trying to say is they may not always look at your, look at the beauty that you have with the Lord each and every day, but in those moments when the Holy Spirit is flowing and the anointing of the King is speaking through you, you have to understand and believe that, you're, that He's using you as a vessel and that at that moment it's Jesus that's talking, amen, and that, and that He's loving, and at that moment you're pretty attracted to that person too. And, and, and the Lord will make it to where you have something that they want. 
Amen. 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 And I just want to encourage you with that. And look, look, Ephesians chapter 5, now I'm going back to the ESV version. It's Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 and 2 says this, Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love as Christ loved us, loved us, and gave himself up for us a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Yeah. And not only is Jesus a sweet fragrance to the Father, when we walk in love and do the will of God, we become a sweet smelling fragrance to God. When we walk in his will and we do what he's asked us to do. Amen? Look at 2 Corinthians 2, or let me just read it to you. For we are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who who are perishing. You know what? Can you put it up there for me? I'm sorry. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 15 and 16, because I want you to see this. I want to slow down on this one. I didn't know I was going to do this, but I think the Lord wants you to see this. It says, we are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. Now, what I want you to see first, though, is this. Who are we the aroma of Christ to? God, right? In other words, we're not the aroma of Christ necessarily to those people. We're the aroma of Christ to God among two kinds of people, both those that are being saved and those that are perishing. So sometimes your life, as you live for Jesus out in the midst of the public eye, sometimes you're, you're not going to smell like you're not going to, you know what I'm saying? You're not going to smell like the sweet fragrances of God to them because they don't understand the sweet fragrances of God. And, and the reality of it is, is that the aroma, but, but that's not who you're here to please. Yes, you're here as a, through a desire to reach one more, to be used by God to help one more because that's part of the plan of God. And we'll get to that in the message in a moment. But, but what I'm trying to say is this, we're really here to please him. And that's the same thing that the Lord set me free over the last year about a, about a, 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 a service in, in, you know, in a church. We're not here to, quote unquote, please you. We're not here to, to, to be seeker sensitive. We're here to be Holy Spirit sensitive. We're here to prepare an atmosphere where the Holy Spirit wants to be in this house. Not not, I don't, I'm not trying to be ugly because, listen, I talk to worldlings all the time. Or, what, what do you want to call them, a worldling or an earthling? I talk to worldlings all the time, every day, and I pour my heart out before them that they would know the Jesus that I know. But if you think for one second I'm going to prepare the atmosphere of a church service just so that they'll be happy and feel comfortable sitting in a church whenever I'm over here, Jesus wasn't seeker sensitive, my friend. He said, if you love your mother and your father more than me, then you're not worthy of me. And he hung naked on the cross. God God the Father wasn't seeker sensitive. He needed to be Holy Spirit sensitive. Yes. Let that, maybe if we'll do that and reverence his presence, he'll, he'll keep blessing us with more and more of him. And he'll keep changing us more and more on the inside. Yes. So it would be an aroma of Christ to the God. To one a fragrance from death to death, to other a fragrance of life to life. I wanted you to see how her companion saw her from the perspective of her love for him. And I wanted you with those verses we just read to see how God sees those that are living a life of love towards him. But if we go, when we go back to chapter one, we're going to go back to chapter one in the ESV in verse five. I want you to see something. She sees herself in a self-conscious way. Have any of you, when you first got saved and the Holy Spirit came to live in your heart, this happened to me. Dude, I wanted to tell people about the Lord some kind of way. I, I, it was weird. It was like, it wasn't, I can't even say that I was really flowing in the Holy Spirit like I needed to be. But but there was, I, I was being, it's almost like I was being compelled. Yes. Like I really believed it now. And I felt like I, I, I told some of y'all that story that my dad, how he was old, you know, hard head kind of guy. And I'll never forget the first time he came to Louisiana and I was riding in the car with him. And, uh, and I was tossing and turning through the night. I was sitting, sleeping on Debbie's, my sister Debbie's couch. I was tossing and turning. Like, hey, he's coming to my God. 
got to tell him about Jesus. And I'm so intimidated by this man, you know. Because I, I don't even think I want to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And I'm like, but I got to tell him because Jesus, I want to do this. Dude, I was distraught, man. I was losing sleep. And, and you know, and, and, I, and I'll never forget. Like, I don't even know. I did. I was like, Dad, anybody ever tell you that Jesus died for you and that he loved you? Like, yeah, that's what they told me in Catholic school, boy. And then, and then, you know, about a year later, I was in the car with him, and I was like, Dad, I, I just got to tell you that, that Jesus loved you, and he and he died He died on the cross for your sin. He's like, boy, you don't know the things I've done. But you know what? As time went on, hallelujah, I know that his heart became <coughs> soft. And what is my point? My point is we become self-conscious. We become, we feel like we're not worthy. First of all, we do. We need to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We need to call out to the Lord that he fill us up to overflowing with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Second work of grace. Lord, fill us up with your Holy Ghost. Amen. And let the love of Christ come flowing out of us. If you've never received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you need to cry out to Jesus the baptizer and you need to say, fill me up Hold, fill me up with your Holy Spirit, amen? And fill me to overflowing that I'd be a vessel used by you. To be, because listen, once you get filled with the Holy Ghost and the boldness of the Lord, you get, that's like that Brandon Lake song, you'll have a lion in your lungs, my friend. Yeah. Because that, see, that's the purpose of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, amen? The purpose is that you'd be a witness for the kingdom. Praise God, amen? And that's where it's got to start. All right, so what I'm trying to tell you is this. Is that sometimes we become apprehensive of how others view us. We can become so self-conscious rather than Christ-conscious that we allow others to affect our witness. <coughs> Help us, Lord. Y'all know, know I'm telling the truth right here. All right, so look at verse 5. Listen, I want to tell you a little story about this. I was over here. The camera won't be able to see, but in this corner. About a year ago, when we were praying, you know, I was in here praying. And about right here, all of a sudden, out of nowhere, while I was praying, it just came out. Yes. I forgot to even do this verse. Man. I said, Lord, make me like the Shulamite. That's who she is, the bride. She's called the Shulamite. I said, Lord, make me like the Shulamite. Make my skin dark from being in the vineyard and doing your work. And let me not be ashamed about the changes that are taking place to me because I'm doing work in your vineyard and I'm telling people about your love and I'm telling people about your goodness. Lord, give me the, the heart of the Shulamite and the love for, for my king like she has. And it just popped up out of there. And so from that day, I, just been, I keep going back to it, keep reading it. But look what she says. I am very dark but lovely, O daughters of Jerusalem, like the tents of Kedar, like the curtains of Solomon. Do not gaze at me because I am dark. If you look into King James, it says, don't, don't look at me because of that. And, and if you look it up in the, in the Hebrews, it's like, don't, don't stare at me. Don't stare at me. See, that's what they're doing. They're looking look at that dark skin. See, it was probably back in those days that you'd stay indoors to try to stay out of the sun, and it was probably like a societal kind of thing, you know, kind of like, I don't know what the new fat is now. But in other words, if you had to go out into the sun and your skin got darker, it was showing that you were probably a servant or something of that nature. And she said, no, don't stare at me because my skin is, is, is dark like that. So she sees herself. She, look what she said, dude, this is so powerful to me. I don't think I'm overdoing it. My mother's sons, her brothers, were angry with me, and they made me keeper of the vineyards. But my own vineyard, another translation says, my own complexion I have not kept. If that is not a picture of a true servant of the Lord, where, listen to me, church, I'm not fussing about other churches right now. I done gave that up for, I'm not going to say lit, but I gave that up entirely. I'm not telling y'all never call somebody out if they're doing something wrong. But when I'm, because Paul called out Peter and Antioch. And so there is a precedence for it. When people are preaching false doctrine and causing hypocrisy in the church, there's a place for it. But anyway, we're not doing that. What I'm trying to say, though, is this. Is that there's a true work of the kingdom and there's a false work of the kingdom. That's right. And a true work of the kingdom is that you and I, with a personal, intimate relationship with Jesus... Allow the Holy Spirit to form Christ in us, yes. and we bring that Christ into a lost and dying world on our jobs, one person at a time, in our families, with our children, 
right? We, 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 we take time to intercede for the kingdom of God. We, we, we call out and we join with God in prayer. We give voice to God in prayer that his will would be done on the earth because he has chosen to partner with mankind and he uses human beings in that way. Amen. He, he, some of us, we, we might even have a personality. We might even be going, ready to go knock on the door to tell somebody about Jesus. I don't really care if they think I'm a Jehovah's Witness. If the Jehovah's Witnesses are doing it, you can guess what? I'm probably going to do it because somebody needs to hear the good news of Jesus. And so that's what I'm trying to say though. It's from an overflow of love and an intimate relationship with Jesus and a belief that if people do not receive him as their Lord and Savior, they will perish. Buddha can't save you. Allah can't save you. Krishna can't save you. Ain't none of them died for the sins of mankind. Jesus, the God-man, became flesh. He dwelt upon the earth. He kept the law. He fulfilled the law of God, which was God's holiness and God's character. And then he took himself and he died upon the cross in his, to, as a sinless man to pay the, the, the debt, the wage debt of sin, which was what we received from our father, Adam, who was created in the image and likeness of God without sin. That's why it requires a sinless man to pay the penalty for sinful men. You can't die for your sin. I can't die for my sin. The terrorist can't die for his sin because all of our blood is tainted with sin. And that's why it took Jesus. And so, so we share this good news. And, and, then, and then as we grow in Christ, see, we turn the church into something different. I'm telling you right now, this American thing we got going on is not the way it looked before. We done turned this thing. And listen, I'm going to tell you right now, this is reality. I, I love church history, too. And I'm going to tell you, whenever the Azusa Street Revival hit, y'all know oh, William Seymour down the road, Centerville, right? And the Azusa Street Revival hit, people started getting filled with the Holy Ghost. They were on fire for the Lord and they were witnessing kingdom business. Amen. Yes, the God, God was moving in a mighty way. And then all of a sudden, about 20 years ago, some guy got really smart. He said, you know what? I think we need to shift this. And so he goes into the neighborhood of California and he starts knocking on doors. And he's got a list and he says, hey, we just want to know what we can do in the church service to make it more palatable for you? What can we do to make it a little bit more comfy? Okay, to where we can, you know, to where we can tailor to you, cater to you. Oh, well, if you shorten, if you get that preacher to quit preaching so long, if you let that song service be a little bit uh, less time, and if you take those goofy looking croak, Choir robes. I'm not. I ain't, I'm not married to choir robes. I'm just trying to make a point. Uh, or if you get a little fog machine or whatever. We would like that. That would be groovy, and, and we could come. We could come chill with y'all. Okay, but that, that's they call that the that's the seeker sensitive movement. I'm here to tell you right now that that has infiltrated the American church, and it's all over the place. It's up and down the roads of mod, of modern America, and that is not the will of God. The will of God is that you and I act like this Shulamite would develop an inter, intimate relationship with our King, that we'd be filled up with the Holy Spirit, that we'd learn the Word of God, that we'd show gratitude to Him, and then out of a thankful heart, when the Holy Spirit opened the door, you ain't like me, I ain't like you, so don't you do it like I do it, and I'm not going to do it like you do it, but we're all supposed to do it. However, we're supposed to do it with the help of the Holy Spirit, and when the Lord opens up the door, there it is, right there. And there's that opportunity to sow a seed, to pull a weed, to pour some water on the seed. Amen. To believe God like the, like the farmer that puts the seed and he sits back. He says, I don't see it yet, but I know it's going to happen. The stalk's going to come first, then the head's going to come, and then the grain's going to come in the head. I know it's going to happen because it's the powerful, powerful principle of sowing and reaping. And, not the, and listen, we're going to turn that into a whole other thing too. Sow your thousand dollar seed. Guess what? It's going to work. It'll work if you'll do it. But look, this is the Thing. What about spiritual seed? What about spiritual seed? If you will sow spiritual seed and believe it, hallelujah, because you know what the word of God says, I pray that you that you would prosper as your 
soul prospers. That's good. That's Come on. Good. I want God to prosper me any old way he chooses. Amen. Amen. But I don't want to go to heaven with pockets full of money and not a crown uh, full of jewels to throw at his feet. Yeah. Lord help us. Amen. All right. She says she, she, why she's dark is because she's been working in the vineyard in the heat of the sun. Her brothers made her do it. Her brothers made her do it. And that's what I was trying to get at. See, we live in a the, in the world where the church age has changed so much. that I remember one time, dude, my, really probably my favorite pastor. I'm not going to say his name. My, my, I sat in there. He, he could communicate. I remember one time he preached a message on personal evangelism in the church. And I'm telling you right now, people were squirming like nobody's business in the seats. And it's not supposed to be like that. We don't want to talk about personal evangelism because it makes people feel weird. I'm not here to make you feel weird. I'm here to tell you that if you fall in love with your Jesus, that when you talk, you're going to leave a beautiful or fragrant aroma behind you and that people are going to start to want to know the Jesus that you love. That's the gospel. Amen. And I'm not going to shrink away from the reality that, that you and I are supposed to live for the Lord in such a way, the way that he's created us to do that. You're different than I am. Amen. I know I've made that point. Uh, but so, so anyway, so here we go. So she's in the vineyard. She's toiling in the vineyards. One more minute of one more day in hopes that the seed I plant, the weed I pull, the water is going to result in a soul, in a soul an increase for my king's kingdom. You know, there's two parables about vineyards in the New Testament in Matthew chapter 21. <laughs> one of them said this. It said there were two, a man had two sons and he told him to go work in the vineyard. And the first son said, eh, I'm not going to do that. But later he went and did it. And then there was another saying, okay, I'll do it. But he never went and did it. And Jesus said, which one do you think basically did the right thing? Well, it was the first one. He said, that's right. And the and he said, the tax collectors and the prostitutes will enter the kingdom of God, and you're not going to enter the kingdom of God. And you know why? Because when they first heard the gospel, they were like, eh, that ain't for me. But then somewhere down the road, the Lord smote their heart. They repented, amen. They gave their heart to the Lord, and then they came into the kingdom, and they did work for the king. Whereas these religious folk, they were like, oh, yeah, I'm going to do the work of the Lord, but they never really did the work of the Lord. They did the work that was for their own selves. I could get into the other one, but it'd take a little bit too long. So we're just going to keep going. So this is where we were born in human history. I guess I need to kind of talk to you about it a little bit. That other, that other one says a man, he was a landowner, and, he, and, and in his property, he built a hedge around it, and he dug a wine press, and he made a tower. You know what he did? He was getting everything prepared for harvest. And, and I want you to know that God has... For his, with his church and really the plan of salvation, he created a nation called Israel out of Abraham. And through Israel, he gave the world Jesus. And in Jesus, and then through the death and through the, the day of Pentecost, he gave us the Holy Spirit. He has already prepared everything so that he can receive his harvest. And, and he, said, he said he got everything prepared and then he leased out the land to some tenants. And then came the day when he was ready to receive his harvest. But when he came, he sent some servants. He said, hey, go get them a harvest. And when they saw the service, they beat them up yeah. and killed them. So he said some more. They did the same thing. So he said, I'm going to send my son. Talking about Jesus. I'm going to send my son. Now, they said, let us kill him and we'll take his inheritance. That's what they did. They nailed him to a cross. He said, you know what? He said, I am going to give this to a people that will give me my fruit in its season. Who's he talking about? He's talking about you, church. Yes. He's talking about he gave the gospel to you so that you could partner with him in kingdom business so that when he returns, Matthew 24 says, who's he going to find doing the work when he returns? What faithful servant? He, do you, you, you get what I'm trying to tell you that he's coming back? Do you, do you even believe that this morning? Some of you believe it. Some of you are not convinced. Yeah, it's okay. I used to be, I used to be like that. No, he's coming back. Yes. And he's asking the question, who's going to be a faithful servant doing what I called them to do, being about the father's business when I return? Who's going to be like the Shulamite and her skin come, becoming dark because she's been in the vineyards working for her king? And I'm not talking about keeping the nursery. We might need a nursery worker, but I'm saying I'm not, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about church work. 
I'm talking about falling in love with Jesus. And I'm talking about doing kingdom work. And sometimes that means church work and sometimes it doesn't. It means living for Jesus in the midst of a lost and a dying world. Amen. Throughout the word of God, he reminds us that he will return for his people, his bride. And I don't think that the Song of Solomon is any different. Let's look at this real quick. ESV version, chapter 2, verses 8 through 13. We're almost done. Bear with me just a little bit longer. Verse 8, she says, The voice of my beloved. Behold, he comes, leaping over the mountains, bounding over the hills, my, my beloved is like a gazelle or a young stag. Behold, there he stands behind our wall, gazing through the windows, looking through the lattice. My beloved speaks and says to me, Arise, my love, my beautiful one, and come away. For behold, the winter is past. The rain is over and gone. You ever thought, man, that this, yeah. this life is like, oh, winter, a dreary day sometimes, yes. man. I wish this cold rain would stop, right? There's coming a day whenever the dreariness is going to be over with, my friend. Yeah. It's going to be sunshine and flowers blooming. You hear me? He's, he's, she says, he says, for behold, the winter is past. The rain is over and gone. The flowers appear on the earth. The time of singing has come. The voice of the turtle dove. I wish I could just preach on the turtle dove for about 20 minutes and tell you, remind, let me just at least remind you that that was one of the sacrifices that Noah offered up to God after he got off the boat. Let me just let you know, that's one of the Levitical sacrifices. And if I'm not mistaken, that's the sacrifice that Joseph Joseph and Mary had to offer when Jesus was born because they were poor folk, okay? So let me, I just wish I had time to preach on the turtle dove, but there's a little log out for you, okay? The fig tree ripens. Its figs and the vines are in blossom. They give forth fragrance. Arise, my love, my beautiful one, and come away. Hallelujah. So I'm closing with this last scene. It's a Song of Solomon, chapter 5, verses 2 through 8. This is her dream. This is her dream whenever she's asking the daughters of Jerusalem, hey, if you find my beloved, uh, please help me find him because I'm lovesick. I, 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 can't, I, I, need, I need to be with him. I need to be with him. And, and that's whatever they said. Who is your beloved? You remember that? All right. So, but you see, it was a dream. The whole thing is a dream, this part right here. And, and it gets kind of shaky here in a moment because, see, the sad truth is I wish that we could always preach happy stuff but the sad truth is is that within every church you enter into there's going to be people that are that their hearts are not truly right with the lord right i mean can we all can we agree to that maybe that, that there might be someone in here that there's the possibility that their heart might not be where the lord wants it to be right and 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 listen you're either in or you're out when it comes, you're either justified by faith or you're not. You're either truly saved or you're not. So you're either going to make it in or you're not. But there's scriptures that talk about the fact that there's many people that thought that they were okay and they weren't. Amen. Amen. And I don't know about you, but I'll probably preach on the watchman next week. I don't want nobody's blood on my hands, my friend. I'd rather have five people in the church and know that your heart's okay than to have 150 and not really know whether or not you're okay. That's how I feel. I don't want to be responsible for 500 people that, that don't even want to be pastor. <laughs> I don't want to be responsible for that for one second. I don't care how much ties they write. That doesn't mean anything to me. Hey, somebody help me, please. Give me an amen. <laughs> you know? look, look, this is what she says. She says, I slept, but my heart was awake. A sound. My beloved is knocking. Boy, did that not remind you of Revelation chapter 3? Verse 14, behold, I stand, I knock at the door. He's on the outside of the church, by the way, knocking. All right. I sound, my beloved is knocking. Open to me, my sister, my love, my dove, my perfect one. For my head is wet with dew, for my locks with the drops of the night. He's coming, I put in this, this is my words. He's coming in the midnight hour. And right now, you're going to see she's acting like one of those unwise virgins. She says, I had put off my garment. How could I put it on? I had bathed my feet. How could I soil them? My beloved put his hand to the latch, and my heart was thrilled within me. If you if you study this deep enough, it's actually it sounds like it's talking about bug flies in your belly. It's it's like a flood. You, know, you, know what I'm about? you ever yeah. felt that way before? It's like, and it's 
like you feel it, it, excited? Do you think that that's not going to be exciting whenever gravity loses its hold and we go to meet the Lord in the air? <laughs> you think that's not going to be exciting when you take your last breath here? You take your first breath there, my friend. Oh, it's going to happen. You think it's not going to be exciting when you walk on streets of gold? Amen. It's going to be exciting. You're going to be so happy that you had a, that that you allowed the Holy Spirit to have His way in your heart and that you developed an intimate relationship with Jesus. You, on that day, nobody's gonna you, listen. You won't be worried about how dark your skin is on that day. You won't be worried about what people thought about you on that day. You're gonna be oh, you'll be so thankful. Y'all know what I'm talking about. So her heart was thrilled with him, and she said, oh, no, he done got me. Now I'm getting up out of this bed, even if my feet get dirty. She said, I rose to open to my beloved, and my hands dripped with myrrh. That's the first bad sign right there. See, because myrrh, they used myrrh to embalm dead bodies. Myrrh is, a, is a, it's not always used for that, but it's a resin from a tree that was used to hide the smell of death. So many times whenever you see the word myrrh used, it's describing something connected to death. So she finally gets up. She tarried a little while longer in the bed. She slumbered just a little while longer, but she finally, now he's aroused my heart. Let me get up. She says, and my hands dripped with myrrh. My fingers with liquid myrrh on the handles of the bolt. I opened to my beloved, but my, my beloved had turned and gone. Oof. I think these guys, it didn't happen in there, but same line. Pondering. Ponder that for a moment. You can't scare nobody into the kingdom of God, my friend. But I'll tell you one thing, you can sure enough provoke somebody's heart. That they would start for themselves to cry out to the Lord and ask God to have his way in their heart. Her beloved had gone. My soul failed me when he spoke. I sought him, but I found him not. I called him, but he gave no answer. The, the greatest thing that God could ever do for us if we're living a life of compromise is to give us one of the most horrendous dreams. Either one of his overwhelming love or one that would just strike fear in our heart to the point where he grabbed grab a hold of us. Somebody, I think it was Robert, was sharing a testimony of some girl that would get a tattoo and all of a sudden she became numb. It was like she became paralyzed on the tattoo table from the neck down. It was like the Lord drug her to hell and she said it was a hell that was prepared just for her. All of her life, all of her memories, all of the times that she had been approached, all of the things, I don't know exactly what it was all about, but it was tailor-made for her. And then all of a sudden she came out of it and she, like, she went nuts over, bro. She's like, it's real. Oh, my gosh, it's real. Her whole family thought she was crazy. She's driving down the road. And she's like, Lord, you got to reveal yourself to me. <laughs> because, because this is real. And look, and I, my understanding is that she's serving the Lord. Now, and she's on fire for Jesus. See, that's one of the best things that could ever happen. Either yes. we got a taste of what that is going to be like, or we got a taste of his goodness and his grace and the overwhelms us with his love. You know what? I'm good with it. I don't really want to have to go that route when I got to see that other thing. But I'm just like, Lord, just overwhelm me with your love. And thank you for that, sister. Thank you for doing that to her, Lord. We wake us up, amen? Because he's gone. She, she tarried a little too long. And, and, and she's gone. I called him, but he gave no answer. Verse 7. Look at this. Don't, if this don't sound like the tribulation to you, the watchmen found me as they went about in the city. They beat me and they bruised me. Look at this. They took away my veil. Ooh, that's the first time that ever hit me like that. They took away wow. my veil. Wow. I'm no longer his brother. The whole time I thought I was, I was, I thought I was his brother. And at the last moment, I, I wasn't his bride after all. She has no veil. Those watchmen of the walls, I adjure you, O daughters of Jerusalem, if you find my beloved, there she goes. That's where we were a while back. If you find my beloved, won't you tell him that I'm sick with love? I, my last question I had here was, are you sick with love for him this morning? Do you miss him? Do you long to be in his presence or has something else grabbed a hold of your heart? Let's go ahead and start playing. Father, in the name of Jesus.